Hey guys, welcome to chapter 21. So, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking to yourself, Mullen, when are we ever going to get to World War I? You promised us all the way back in chapter 17 that we were going to get to World War I, and we're not at World War I yet. How long does this go until we get there? One more chapter. We got to get through one more chapter. We've set up all of these dominoes that lead to World War One into the huge changes in the United States. And now, finally, we're going to see the very last domino to fall before we are ready for World War One. Let's look at the goals of this chapter. Um, we're going to look at the problems of this era and look at a group of people who are going to solve them. In fact, if that's all you get out of chapter 21, well, you probably won't pass the test. But if that's all you out of chapter 21 is that there are problems in this era and then they're going to be solved, that is the main theme. That's the main theme. Um, the group of people are going to be involved in those changes. We're going to talk about who those are. Uh, we're also going to look at the changes that are made and a new political philosophy that is born out of this era. And finally, we're going to look at the presidents of this era and how they reflect what this era was. So let's start by looking at the problems of this era. So from 1880 to 1900, we've been industrializing as a country. We spent a chapter on westward expansion. We spent a chapter on the rise of big business. We spent a chapter on American imperialism. So now we have to look at like, what are the consequences of all of those things? What are the consequences of industrialization? What are the consequences of imperialism? Well, that's what this chapter starts off with. There are a couple of major problems that the United States is facing now that we have industrialized. Number one, working conditions were inherently unsafe for workers, and the government was not concerned with the well-being of its own citizens. So going to work is unsafe, and the government doesn't care. Number two, New social philosophies begin to challenge the laissez-faire mentality of the time period. Specifically, there's going to be some attitudes in Europe and Eastern Europe. There's going to be a rise of socialism, which is going to say that, hey, the poor and the working class should have a better life than this. Number three, big business is also proving to become detrimental to the success of the country. The problem is that the big businesses are now controlling major industries. There's no more competition, and now the American public is basically living at the whim of a couple of major industrialists. The country is changing. This is number four. The country is changing at a rapid rate, and not necessarily for the best. Reformers wanted to return to the moral values of the United States pre-industrialization. And finally, number five, the fifth biggest problem of this time period, is that neither political party really cares about any of the issues I've just addressed. In fact, the current president at this time period is a guy named William McKinley. He's a Republican, and he's more concerned with foreign policy than actually changing the political landscape and listening to his own citizens. So if the government's not going to fix these problems, who is? And well, this is actually where we're going to have uh, some females enter the story. If you guys have been paying attention, and I'm sure you have, you will we'll have noticed that throughout history, we've actually had a couple of different stopping points where it's been women that have led to social change. If you look at the Second Great Awakening, and you look at the... Um, and of course, now that I'm on video, I am blanking on what it's called. Oh yeah, if you look at the temperance movement of the Second Great Awakening, you will notice that it's actually women that are going to lead some social changes. So the same thing's going to happen in the early 1900s. We've developed this new weird thing in the United States, and it's this thing called a middle class. So our story so far that we've been telling has been about the super, super wealthy, like Carnegie and Rockefeller, and the super, super poor, like the uh, new immigrants coming into the country. But there's some people in the middle, like who manages these factories? Well, those are going to be middle class workers. They're going to make enough money that um, one male income is going to be enough for an entire family. So this leaves us with the question of what are women going to do with all of their time? 
And that's essentially what is going to spring a lot of these big changes going on here. Um, so these people that have more disposable income and time, they begin to feel compelled to help out the lower classes while gaining social improvements for themselves. We call this the social gospel movement. This is a movement mainly influenced by women, as I have already said. Women are having fewer children and are no longer forced to remain in the home. They begin to enter the social and political sphere and begin to demand changes. Along with the settlement house movement that we learned about in previous chapters, there's going to be a new movement called uh, Slum Brigades. Slum Brigades are going to be women who are going to go from tenement to tenement and attempt to clean it up. Like they're basically going to go in and, for lack of a better phrase, clean up all the trash that is going on, um, both literally, as in the physical trash that is in these areas, and also in a figurative sense. Like they're going to basically try to clean up how the people in these tenements are living. Things like soup kitchens, public schools, public facilities are all going to be built by the middle class to help out the poor during this time period. And it's just one way that we're going to start seeing in changes and improvements in this country. And again, the government had nothing to do with it. Those women who set out to, who saw a problem in the society and decided to fix it themselves, that's going to be the start of a bigger movement. And that movement is going to be called the progressive movement. Now, I'm going to actually go a little bit out of order here, and I'm going to talk about what progressivism is on a large scale, and then we're going to go back and see how they do it. So progressivism inherently is the belief that we can change the country and make it better. And when I say we, I mean us as citizens. We're not going to depend on the government to solve every problem. We, as citizens, are going to solve this problem. The best way to remember progressivism is exactly how I'm going to teach it to you guys. It starts by people noticing a problem, by fixing a small local problem, and then having this grow into a large national change. We haven't had an amendment to the Constitution in a little while, but from the, eight, from the years 1910 up until 1933, we're going to have, let me count really quick, one, two, three, four, five amendments in that time period. So we haven't done much to change anything about this government in a long time, and we're going to have a lot of drastic changes by the end of this chapter. And that's essentially what we're going to be talking about. How do we go from small changes that individuals make to large national changes that drastically change what this country is about? Progressives are going to have seven major goals. Let's look at these seven major goals. Number one, progressives want to con uh, return control of the government to the people. Right now, we have a couple of rich industrialists that basically control the entire country. Progressives are going to want to return the control to the average citizens. Next, they want to make industry more humane, which is a fancy way of saying Let's make it so that way you don't die at work, which, you know, is nice. They want to protect the social welfare. It's a fancy way of saying they want to kind of help improve the morals of this time period. Number four, they want to foster efficiency in business and government. That's a fancy way of saying they want to make sure everything runs more efficiently and correctly and cleanly. Number five, they're going to be big on economic reforms, specifically when it comes to taxes and where tax money comes from. Number six, they want to promote uh, moral improvement, which actually ties back into number three with social welfare. And then finally, they're going to want to promote rights for women and minorities. These are all things that we're going to see happen during this chapter. And in fact, if you wanted to be super, super smart, and maybe I'll do it for you, um, <laughs> if you wanted to be super smart, you should really be looking at these seven goals, because I know you've written them down by this point. You should be looking at these seven goals and seeing specifically how the progressives address them. How are each of these seven goals addressed? What major themes, what amendments to the Constitution are going to exist that show that the progressives have dealt with these issues? Now let's look at how it's done. Let's look at how we solve these uh, seven issues. Now a better teacher would have put those seven issues in proper order of how we're going to discuss them in the textbook. 
That's what a better teacher would have done. But I'm going to go in the order that your textbook gave the answers to those questions, which is in no way close to the order that they give them to you. So not only am I a lazy teacher, you also have a textbook that uh, is illogical at times. So um, <laughs> let's just roll through this and see if we can cover as much stuff as possible. So how do we promote the social welfare? I have an idea. Let's send all of you kids to school. Now, we've talked in the past about reformers like Horace Mann in the 1860s that is going to be encouraging public education. But that's only really going to be a popular thing in the North. In the American South, they're not going to be so big on public education. Well, there's no better way to protect the social welfare than to have you kids not working in factories and to be in school. Because you know what? If you're in school, you're going to be learning the skills that will help you make a better world. We'll watch a video about this in class. But the reason why it promotes the social welfare to have you kids in school is that you being in school means you can learn things to make the world better for everyone. To put it plainly, I pay taxes to make sure that there are public schools that can educate you guys. That way you can make a better world for me to live in. You guys being in this classroom make my world better, no matter how much you hate it. By 1918, every state in the, in the United States, which by this point we have 48 of them, by 1918, all 48 states had enacted laws about compulsory education. So if you are under the ages, I believe at this point it's only 16, if you are under the age of 16, you are going to be in a public school at this time period. This is when it starts. It's good for us that you're in school. One of the main themes of progressivism is to help educate the people as to what the problems of the country are. We don't know what to fix if we don't know it's a problem. So what starts to happen during this time period is that we're going to have a group of people that are going to inform us of problems in this country. We call these people muckrakers. A better word for it that is a little bit more familiar to you guys is going to be the phrase investigative reporter. If you guys ever turn on the news at like 11 o'clock, they always have like uh, the local news reports about this problem. And look at this person got a parking ticket because they parked in front of their house. And isn't this awful that there is some rule that makes it so that way this old elderly grandmother gets a parking ticket? Yeah, you've all seen what I'm talking about. Well, what tends to happen because of these things is that the news reports about an issue, no matter how small and trivial it might seem, the news reports about an issue, people get upset about it, they demand change from the government, and then suddenly that grandmother can park in front of her house and not get a ticket. Okay, That's what happens in the modern world today. Well, we're going to see this same exact thing happening during the progressive era. Who does it? There are these people called muckrakers. These are going to be investigative reporters that report on the ills of society, and they report on a lot of the problems that we realize are problems now. By the way, if you guys want a more current example, as of uh, 2015 when I'm recording this, uh, there was a dude named Edward Snowden who released a bunch of information about improper practices of the U.S. government. Well, he would be considered a muckraker. He's going to release all this information about all these horrible things the U.S. government is doing. And now we as a society are trying to fix those problems. That's exactly what a muckraker would have done at this time period. Let's talk about some muckrakers of the early 1900s. There's going to be a bunch of magazines that start to uh, push and report on facts of American life. Rather than reporting on abstract concepts, they're going to report on facts. This is what's happening in this factory and it's wrong. Or this is what's happening in this factory and it's dangerous and unsafe. In fact, many of these muckrakers are going to work in these factories undercover and have real life experiences that they're going to draw on when they write their articles. There's two really important works of this time period, and we're actually going to read excerpts from a couple of these. Jacob Reese wrote a book ca called How the Other Half Lives, which is exactly what it sounds like. How do the poor, how do immigrants actually live? What is their story in this country? And by the way, it's not good. Next, uh, Ida Tarbell, she wrote a book called The History of Standard Oil. 
And this book is going to take on John D. Rockefeller and his company and explain all the horrible things that his company has done. Which is going to let us know what's going on and it's going to encourage the government to fix it. However, the biggest and uh, most recognizable example <clears throat> excuse me, of the muckrakers, the most uh, poignant one, the one that we're going to read a big long excerpt from, is a book by a dude named Upton Sinclair. He wrote a book called The Jungle. Sinclair is going to work for seven weeks in a meatpacking plant to research what goes on there. And his book is going to tell the story of an immigrant family who comes to America and is going to be taken advantage of by our industrial system in this country. The main characters of this book, and he does write this as a book. He could have done a newspaper article, but this is more poignant as a book. The main characters uh, experience life in the factories. Eventually, the entire family is forced to work in different factories and all end up suffering physical and psychological damage <clears throat> Excuse me, because of it. The main character is injured while working in a meatpacking plant, and then he joins a socialist labor union and becomes an ardent socialist. That's a whole nother theme of a lot of Upton Sinclair's novels. Don't worry too much about knowing that. Um, the book is going to become extremely popular because it describes the horrific living and working conditions of the immigrants in these factories and the unsanitary and unsafe conditions of the food that we Americans are all eating. Once this book is published, uh, it's going to be read throughout the entire country, and Americans are going to be horrified by what they are reading. They're so horrified that they're going to demand action. And because of this, the government is going to pass two laws that uh, basically ensure safety of food even all the way up until today. The first one's called the Meat Inspection Act, which is going to have the government have officials that come and inspect factories to make sure that the food is safe, and the Food and Drug Act, which is essentially going to do the same thing to make sure factories are having safe conditions and are sanitary with the food they're producing for all people. Again, an example of one guy going to work in a factory is going to have a dramatic change in how we eat food even today, a hundred years later. I apologize, O oh future student, because I am jumping around your textbook again, but I think this is actually a good thing. Let's keep with the story of fixing factories. So we have Upton Sinclair talking about the story of the meatpacking industry. Now there's going to be an event that happens during this time period that is going to convince Americans that we have to actually look and think about the factories that our citizens are working in. Really looking at fixing industrial problems truly is the heart of progressivism. While corporations and unions are going to grow during this time period, and wages do increase nationwide, it's still not a enough to cover the standard of living expenses, which is going to force many women and children to work. Up to 1.5 million children under the age of 15 are working in the year 1910, which leads me to the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. The date, not that it matters, is March 25th, 1911. A fire is going to break out on the ninth floor of a textile factory building. The clothes are going to catch fire, which is going to cause the fire to spread rapidly throughout the entire building. Workers begin to flee only to find the fire escapes intentionally locked. So they find the, you know, these doors to help them escape. The doors are intentionally locked, so that way the people can't get out. Dozens of workers are going to leap out of open windows to avoid the flames, only to plummet 95 feet to their deaths. 141 people are going to die in this fire, mostly women. And the sad and tragic part about this, aside obviously from the death, is that pretty much all of these deaths could have been avoided. Had the factory of had a fire escape that actually worked, had the factory of not locked the doors to the fire escape, had the, the high-rise buildings in New York of had um, more than one exit, many of these women may have lived. But a lot of them are going to die because the factory is inherently unsafe. Now, because of pressure by people, and again, 140 women dying is actually going to be a pretty big deal, um, now the government begins to step in and try to protect its citizens. The government's going to pass these things called regulations. 
So regulations are restrictions or rules that businesses have to follow to keep its workers safe. So for example, having a fire escape, um, only having so many people in a room, you may have seen like um, the maximum occupancy signs in most buildings, even our, even like in our um, in our student union, there's a maximum occupancy because that is a safety regulation. It's going to say that you know what this building only has three exits, so we really shouldn't have more than 400 students in here at any given time. That way, those students would be able to exit safely should there be a reason to. That's the logic of that. And now we're going to have regulations all over the country and all sorts of businesses. And in fact, if you want to see regula regulations at work, look at all the stuff that Disney has to go through before they build a ride at Disneyland. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of pages of regulations they have to make sure they're following to keep their employees and their guests and the environment safe. Now the government is super involved in making sure that everyone's safe because of events like this during the Progressive Era. There's also going to be some lawsuits during this time period, basically about the same thing. First case is Mueller v. Oregon, which is going to shorten women's working hours from 14 down to 8. Bunting v. Oregon is going to limit men's working hours to 10, so, you know, equality. And then um, workers' compensation is going to be, is this system that a factory should pay if a worker is injured in their factory. That's actually going to come into place in 1902. So this idea that if I'm hurt at work, work should pay until I get better or to pay to fix me, um, that idea is going to come about in 1902. And slowly but surely, factories are going to become safer for workers in this country. Again, how did it happen? A couple of small incidents are going to encourage the entire country that we have to make nationwide changes. Nationwide changes going all the way up to the Supreme Court. That is exactly what this movement is all about. Remember how about 20 minutes ago I said that progressivism starts as a small local movement and then it's going to grow into a national one? Well, let's look at the story of starting at a small local movement and growing to a national change. Um, this is best seen with the story of Robert Fighting Bob Lafayette, uh, which apparently I've also heard pronounced many other ways that are... I don't know, all French in origin, so I'm going to call him La Folly, which is not close to what, how it's pronounced, but, you know, France. Okay, so, anyway, um, he's going to be the governor of Wisconsin, you know, the cradle of American democracy that is Wisconsin. Anyway, um, Wisconsin's actually going to do some changes. Maybe it's because no one lives there, or maybe it's because it isn't as industrialized as the rest of the North, but also didn't have slavery. So it's like, it's this place where there are genuine, true American farmers that want a better life. I'm not exactly sure why this all starts in Wisconsin, but we're going to see some changes in democracy that happen here. We call it the Wisconsin experiment. All of these random changes in democracy. What are some of these changes? Well, Wisconsin is the first state to institute direct primaries in which state voters nominated their own state or own set of candidates to run for state office. So rather than just people being appointed for office, well, why don't we vote for the people that are going to actually represent us? That sounds democratic, right? But like that wasn't the system for 125 years, but it's going to become the system because Wisconsin's going to try it out. There's going to be a bunch of other uh, political things that are going to be done here um, that are going to be involved with election reform. Let's, you know, take some of the ideas that we already have from the populist party that we discussed in an earlier chapter. You know, things like referendum initiative and recalls, excuse me. And let's do this as a means of giving the voters more power. It's kind of the whole point, right? States are also going to begin to push for the direct, direct election of senators. So the way that senators used to, uh, used to get their job was that they'd be appointed by the state governor. The state governor would appoint the two senators for that state. Well, that, that also doesn't seem super democratic. Wouldn't it make more sense if the people voted for the senators? We only get two, so wouldn't it make sense if the people actually got to vote? That would make a lot of sense. 
but it doesn't actually happen until the 17th Amendment, which is going to be passed because a state like Wisconsin is going to try it out. People tend to like the idea, and they go for it. By the way, Fighting Bob, La Folly, La Foyette, La Follette, I have no idea. He looks like the Aliens guy from the History Channel. I mean, look at him. They're basically the same person. This movement is also going to try to reduce the power of political machines. Public utilities such as water and power were controlled by political machines even all the way up until this era. To fight this corruption, progressives are going to sell public utilities to private companies, making private companies bid against each other for the lowest price and the best service. Unfortunately, the progressives are not going to be uh, super involved with every change, mainly because while all this democracy seems fun at first, eventually voter turnout is going to drop. Because it turns out we in America have more things to vote on now than at any previous point in American history, but we also have some of the lowest voter turnout, especially in non-presidential elections. Hmm. Progressives are next going to take aim at the cities of this time period. The cities in the early United States are disgusting, to say it nicely. I have been to China, and I think that the cities in early America must have been worse than what I saw in China. And when I went to China, there was a whole day I didn't see the sun because there was so much smog. So, cities during in the United States during this time period are perhaps worse than what a smog-filled day in China would be like today. Uh, the reason why is that he, the there's so much there's just too many humans in these cities. There is so many humans, but there are inadequate sewer systems, no trash pickup, so people would just literally just throw their stuff in the street. And there, uh, in some cities, there would be pigs and animals that would just wander up and down the streets, and they would eat through people's trash. And since no one's taking care of the pigs, they would just defecate where they defecated, and you just kind of have to uh, step over it. It's really, really, really disgusting. Progressives are going to begin to demand simple things like trash pickup and public parks and street lights and street sweeping and plumbing. And little things like that are going to make cities significantly more sanitary. In fact, with just the advent of trash pickup, infant mortality and tuberculosis, tuberculosis rates among infants are going to drop 50%. Just because we decided, hey, let's take all the trash and pay people to put it somewhere that we're not. That sounds sanitary. History's kind of funny. And again, this is only 115 years ago when I'm recording this. And for you guys, whenever you're listening to this, could be, you know, 110 years ago. I mean, it's like not that long. 110. It's not that long ago. <laughs> Now let's uh, reintroduce the women to the story because really it's going to be the women of this time period that are not only going to fix the uh, disgusting nature of this time period, they're also going to work on the moral improvements that are necessary during this time period. Now we have spoken about liquor before in this country, uh, in this class I should say. We talked about the temperance movement, the idea that when men abuse alcohol, it is women that suffer. So women are going to become very big on the moral attitude that alcohol is a moral wrong, not just a sin or an abuse that people are using. This movement that we talked about all the way back in the 1840s is now going to really, really become super, super popular in the early 1900s. Um, one of the main proponents of social change is going to be the Women's Christians Temperance Movement of this time period. They're going to take on alcohol, which we'll get to that in a second, but they're also going to take on um, prostitution. One of their first things that they said was that, hey, you know what, if we women want to be moral authorities, we have to make sure that we are acting more moral. And one of the big problems that women had during this time period was prostitution. Turns out one out of every 50 women in the year, or sorry, one out of every 50 women in the year 1910 was a prostitute. One out of every 50. 2% of the U.S. population, 
or are females in the United States were prostitutes during this time period, that is a uh, pretty high number. Why are women doing it? Well, women were turning to prostitution because they could make more money as a prostitute than they, can, they could as a worker. Research paid for by the progressives is going to be put into newspapers telling women the dangers of these things called sexually transmitted diseases, which we weren't really sure what those were before this time period. And, slowly but surely, the prostitution problem is going to start to correct itself and go away, mainly because women are going to be told that there is a better way to live. The next major thing that these women are going to attack is going to be, of course, alcohol. They're going to say that, you know what, temperance isn't good enough. The problem is we're still drinking as a country, so instead of just limiting the consumption, which of course is what temperance stands for, instead we are going to push for prohibition, which means to completely get rid of alcohol, to make it essentially illegal. A powerful uh, group called the Anti-Saloon League is going to be founded in 1895, and they begin to push for complete prohibition from alcohol. Soon, the ASL is going to send out propaganda pieces, specifically posters, demonizing alcohol and alcohol consumption. Like most progressive reforms, this becomes a battle between native-born citizens and immigrants. Turns out immigrants are significantly heavier drinkers than um, native-born Americans. Again, not Native Americans, native-born Americans. Although this movement starts out small, by 1919, it's going to become a national craze to get rid of alcohol. And in 1919, the 18th Amendment is going to be added to the U.S. Constitution, which bans the manufacture, sale, or importation of alcohol into the United States. We're going to make alcohol illegal. Why? It's a small problem, or sorry, it's a big problem, that starts on a small scale and then it's going to expand and be something that the entire country decides that we need to fix. It's exactly how this movement works. And of course, it's after I finish my thought on the previous slide that I remember that I actually have a picture that the Anti-Saloon League is going to be sending out. So all those brilliant points I just said, put them to this slide too. What's interesting about this picture is that you can see the stages of alcohol abuse. Let's do some historical analysis here. You'll see that in the bottom left, the first sip, maybe you are a, uh, I don't know, a lively gentleman about the town. Now, as you have more alcohol, you're going to start uh, conversing with other women. Uh, you're going to start getting into fights with other men around you. You're going to be doing, uh, or you're going to be playing poker or maybe even leading into other drugs, which is going to lead to poverty and disease, which is going to lead you to uh, social, being a social outcast and being kept away from your family which is going to uh, leave you to a life of desperation and crime, and eventually it's going to lead you to suicide. This is what one drink of alcohol could lead to. But notice who in the background is suffering because the man is drinking. That's right, his wife and kids at home are suffering while he is out drinking. This is going to be the message of this time period. With the success of the temperance or prohibition movement, women are going to start to push for other rights. Because, you know, it's the year 1910, and only women can only vote in four western states in the year 1910. Women don't have the right to vote in this country. Well, time to fix that. Women are going to begin to use the 14th Amendment, which defines citizenship, of course, and say that, you know what? Women can't be citizens if they don't have the right to vote. If women don't have the same equal rights as men, they are not citizens, which means the U.S. government is violating the 14th Amendment. Can't vote. You're not a citizen. Uh, a new group's going to form called the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or the NAWSA, headed by a woman named Carrie Chapman Catt. This group is going to believe that women could only gain protections for themselves and for their children if they voted, because obviously men weren't doing enough to care for women and children. They're going to begin a propaganda campaign to get their issue across to the masses. Soon, state after state is going to start to approve this idea of women's suffrage. 
It wasn't until the uh, World War I breaks out that Kat finally convinces the government that women should have the right to vote and that it should be added to the U.S. Constitution. With the 19th Amendment, which is going to be passed in 1920, women now have the right to vote in this country. It only took us, what, 129 years to pull that off? No, like 140 years to pull that off. But ladies, as of 1920, you have the right to vote. Now, before we separate our shoulder, patting ourselves on the back for how great we're becoming as a country, there are some failures of the progressive era. While progressives are going to be quote-unquote concerned about the lives of immigrants, they're going to be pretty much silent on the issues of black Americans, former slaves. The progressive movement doesn't really do much to help former slaves. And in fact, black Americans are really going to have to help themselves. What's going on during this time period is that by 1910, 20% of the nation's black Americans have moved out of the South and into the urban North. By 1930, millions more blacks have moved into the North in what was known as the Great Migration. This migration out of the American South, the Plantation South, and into the Industrial North. While segregation was not necessarily the law in the North, it was in place as a matter of custom anyway. In fact, black Americans did not have a much better livelihood in the North than they did in the South. The same idea of segregation is still going to exist, even if it isn't necessarily as strongly enforced as it's going to be in the American South. In fact, the 1915 film, The Birth, or sorry, Birth of a Nation, glamorized the KKK and became one of the most popular films of the era. A film glorifying the KKK is going to become popular even in the North during this time period. This is kind of what we're dealing with. There's going to be some uh, disagreements in the black community about what should be done to make lives better. A man named Booker T. Washington is going to argue that black, black Americans needed to gain the skills necessary to work within the white world. He argued that if blacks wanted to be equal to whites, they had to learn to operate in the white man's world. Eventually, he argued, whites would learn to accept blacks. His point of view is known as accommodation. His point of view is actually going to be very unpopular at this time period. and It's going to be seen almost as if black Americans are selling out by not fighting for true equality. By just trying to live and deal with the white man's world, that's really not necessarily fair to this idea of whites and blacks should be equal. So Booker T. Washington is not going to be extremely popular during this time period, especially because there's going to be another much more poignant and much more long-lasting opinion of this time period. This man, his name is W.E.B. Dubois. I believe it also could be Dubois. Um, again, another one of those French names that could be any, it's pronounced either way. Um, he's going to argue that black Americans should demand social and political equality with whites in order to gain true economic success. He's going to create the NAACP, or as you guys know it, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1909. And this group is going to be demanding an end to segregation, discrimination, and disenfranchisement of blacks. But here's the problem. Unfortunately for us, I'm actually going to hit, like have to hit the pause button on the black American story because there's going to be some other events that are going to be happening in the forefront of U.S. history. Um, we're going to talk about World War One, the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, World War Two. So your textbook is going to spend a lot of time focusing on that, and it's not going to tell you the story of what's going to happen while all that's going on. So while... America is fighting these wars and going through an economic struggle, during that entire time period, the NAACP is going to be working in the background to legally break down these Jim Crow segregation laws. So your textbook and I am not going to be talking a lot about the, the story of black Americans and the story of the NAACP until we get to the 1950s, but I want you guys to know that the NAACP is going to be working for the next 45 years in the background of the story to tear down segregation. And then once we finish World War II, 
and get into the 1950s, we're going to have an entire unit where we talk about the changes that are going to come from the NAACP working in the background to make lives better for black Americans and really for all Americans. But again, we're going to get to that story in a couple of chapters. 21 chapters in and I've just now realized that you guys can hear when I shuffle my papers as I read over my notes as I do these. Oh well. So, um, I apologize, you know, for all of those noises. Anyway, now that we've talked about a lot of the issues that the progressives have faced, let's go, unfortunately, let's go back and start over again at the year 1900 and talk about the presidents during this time period. Remember, Progressivism starts as a small movement that cha makes national changes. So let's talk about a or the progressive movement now at the national level. And there's no better person to do this with than with my boy, one of my favorite presidents, and really, let's be honest, one of the greatest Americans, Theodore Roosevelt. Now again, before some internet troll yells at me and says, well, what about these eight things that Roosevelt did? Rabble, rabble, rabble. He wasn't the greatest ever, whatever. Um, Roosevelt is one of my favorite presidents because he had a fascinating life. He had a joyous life. And in fact, he enjoyed every minute of being president. And you could see, it's almost like imagine a seven-year-old boy becomes president. Or like a seven-year-old boy becomes an adult, and then that adult, like that boy, then becomes president. That's the story of Theodore Roosevelt. Fascinating story to learn about, and a fascinating man that really does a lot of great things for this country. The thing is, though, he wasn't supposed to be president. The powers that be didn't really like this guy, and to shut him up, they basically gave him the job of vice president. Because as we have learned, the vice president's job is essentially useless in this country. I apologize as of 2015 to Joe Biden. Anyway, um, he's going to be the vice president under a dude named William McKinley. And, well, McKinley's going to die because <laughs> he's going to be assassinated uh, early in 1900. McKinley's going to be assassinated and Roosevelt, of course, is going to take over. In fact, some political leaders were so upset that Roosevelt was now president that one of them was quoted as saying, my God, that damned cowboy is in the White House. Roosevelt is self-righteous, impetuous, super energetic, brilliant, and loved to be the center of attention. He is known as the first modern president. He used public, or sorry, he used popular opinion and the media to shape public policy. We call this the bully pulpit. He was loved by the public for this, but he was hated by other politicians. So what does this mean? Roosevelt was really big on announcing what the country's problems were and making sure everyone knew what the problems were and that they should do something to fix it. So if the progressive era is about Americans learning about a problem and then trying to fix it, Roosevelt is like their mouthpiece. He is going to say, this institution is corrupt. Let's take it down. This problem needs addressing. Let's take care of it. Let's make sure that we preserve the beauty of this country for future generations. Like That's kind of what he does. You guys live in a world where every single time anything happens in the world, the president, as of 2015, Barack Obama, gives a speech about what it is and what's going on. But like before, that wasn't really the case. The president was really not super involved or didn't really address the public all that often. Roosevelt's going to change that, and he's going to use the public to his advantage to get things done while he is president. He's going to come up with the square deal. This is what he offers the United States. He wants to break up harmful business trust. He wants to have government regulation of business. He wants to give labor a fair chance. And he wants to promote conservation of the environment. He is going to be a Republican in name, but really he's a progressive at heart. Let's talk about some of the things that Roosevelt does while he is president to show how he meets not only the square deal, but also the larger goals of the progressive movement. Roosevelt's first major test came from a coal workers strike. 
The United Mine Workers Union wanted more money, shorter hours, and wanted to be recognized as an official union. It's the same thing every union has ever wanted, as we discussed in a previous chapter. They, they went on strike and refused to work. Now this was scary because winter was looming and management also refused to budge. So now we have management and we have the, uh, the workers refusing to budge on this issue. And now the country, which is going to use coal for heat, is not going to, you know, they're going to freeze to death in the winter. Roosevelt's going to step in. T uh, Roosevelt brought both sides to the White House and told them that he would seize the mines and fire all of them if they didn't work something out. He also is going to bring in an independent arbitrator, which is someone who's not related to the issue, to make a decision. Now, long story short, uh, the mine does reopen and Americans don't freeze to death. But see, that's not really the point of why we study this. Roosevelt has done something that no previous president had done. He is going to give labor a fair shot. He is going to let labor have an opinion and have a voice. And that's something that no previous president has really done up to this point. So that is going to be a big drastic change in how the country is run. Okay, this next story is going to sound more complicated than it is. If there is really only one thing that you remember about Teddy Roosevelt, sorry, he hated being called that, Theodore Roosevelt, there's really only one thing you remember about TR in May when you're taking the AP exam. You got to associate Roosevelt with trust busting. Now, as we learned about in a previous chapter, a business trust is when a, it's basically another fancy way of saying a monopoly, right? So Roosevelt and really the progressive movement is going to try to take apart these monopolies. We give Roosevelt the name of a trust buster because he is going to try to get rid of these government, or sorry, these business monopolies. Okay, so let's tell the story. Roosevelt was never a big fan of business tycoons. He thought that businesses were good for imperialism, which he wholeheartedly supports, but he still believed regulation was important for the safety of the average worker. Roosevelt does not like trust, so he's going to take up the idea of trust busting. The Northern Securities Company was a giant trust or holding company that controlled railroads in the Northwest. Roosevelt is going to charge that this railroad violated the Sherman Antitrust Act, which again we've already discussed. The case ends up in the Supreme Court, who ends up siding with Roosevelt. The company is broken up. Congress is going to pass two laws because of this decision. One is called the Elkins Act of 1903, which is going to give a new government agency known as the Interstate Commerce Commission more power to regulate the railroads. The Hepburn Act of 1906 is going to give the Interstate Commerce Commission the power to set railroads uh, prices. That's complicated. What just happened here? Essentially, what happened and what Roosevelt's going to do is he's going to take these big businesses and he's going to want to break them up. He's going to encourage competition. He's going to encourage other businesses to open. That way, we're going to kind of resume what this whole capitalist model is set off of. Using this precedent, the government is going to try to break up several more trusts during Roosevelt's presidency. The biggest legacy, or the, I should say the longest lasting legacy, maybe not the biggest, of Theodore Roosevelt's presidency is going to be his concern about the environment. You see, as Americans are moving westward, we are coming across these beautiful landscapes, and, well, you may ask yourself, why don't we have any beautiful landscapes on the East Coast? Well, we might have, but they were all destroyed in the process of building all these big businesses. So as we're moving westward and we're finding all this empty open land, the question becomes, should this land be used for business or should it be preserved for the natural wonder and beauty that it is? Roosevelt is going to argue that we should make sure that we conserve this land for what it is. He's going to be heavily influenced by a man named John Muir. And of course, as I am still teaching in California when I'm recording this, you guys should all know who this is. This guy is going to be a very big part of the development of a lot of the Western parks that we all know and love here in California. Roosevelt is going to set, over two, set aside over 200 million acres of public land, and he's going to establish the national park system to preserve and protect that land for future generations. 
As you guys know, I am a big fan of this, and I have been to many of the U.S. national parks, and I highly encourage all of you to go. It is one of the most beautiful things about this country, and it's something that we can thank President Roosevelt for. Okay, so your textbook goes on a bit of a tangent here, so I guess I might as well explain it to you. Um, I'm not really sure that if I was writing the textbook, I would put this story here, but they do, so let's just tell it. It's not super difficult, but it's just also going on during this time period. What's the backlash to progressivism? Well, again, we, when we look at this, things in this class, we look at movements and then reactions and reactions and movements and reactions. So what's the reaction to the progressive movement? Well, a lot of people are going to say that, you know, this is starting to sound like socialism. This idea that there is no private ownership of anything and the government's going to control everything and we're all going to have jobs, but we're all going to be, you know, living a horrible, horrible existence. That's going to be coming out of this time period. It's something that we in America inherently fear. We have this fear of socialism, mainly because we don't understand it, but we have this inherent fear of socialism. So the fact that we're going to go away from our democratic capitalist ways and instead have the government controlling how we live and act is really going to scare many Americans. On top of that, many more Americans are going to start joining workers' unions, and workers' unions are also going to be seen as a socialist activity. A new labor union is going to form during this time period known as the Industrial Workers of the World, or the IWW. It starts off small in size, but eventually it's going to become a massive union, and this is going to be a union that is eager to defend itself. Socialism is also going to continue during this era, specifically with the creation of the Socialist Party of America, who's going to run with a guy named Eugene V. Debs as their candidate in every election from 1900 to 1920. At one point, Debs is so popular, he wins 16% of the popular vote. We're going to talk more about this story when we actually get to World War I. So again, your textbook put it here. I wouldn't if I was writing it. But your textbook put it here. We're going to come back to this story when we get to World War I, which is in the next chapter. So it's here. You learned about it. But don't stress too much about it right now. The year is now 1908. Roosevelt has been president for a grand total of eight years. And he goes, you know what? I don't want to be better than Washington. So I'm going to retire. It's been eight years. I'm going to go ahead and retire. I'm not better than Washington. So I'm going to retire. And uh, you know what? I'm so popular. I'm going to go ahead and pick my successor. And he picks this dude named William Howard Taft to run for president. And he basically tells America, hey, Amer America, you like me? Vote for this guy. He's like me, but, you know, well, <clears throat> supersized. So uh, the best way to think of William Howard Taft I want you guys to think of the TV show, The Mythbusters, and unfortunately, as I am recording this, uh, The Mythbusters have essentially been canceled, so it's been their last season. But anyway, um, the, uh, the Mythbusters have two major people involved with it. There's Adam, who's on the right in this picture, and Jamie. Um, Adam is super impulsive. He's kind of reckless. He runs around and... Uh, uh, destroys things in the office. He makes things very quickly without thinking them through. He's very well-spoken. He's very energetic. His polar opposite is Jamie. Jamie is here on the left. Jamie is methodical. He's very slow to speak. He's very slow to act. And that's essentially kind of how he operates. Well, if you look at the Mythbusters, though, Jamie on the left is the better Mythbuster. More things get done under him. He makes better, uh, he makes better, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Experiments. He is the better Mythbuster. Well, the reason why I tell you guys about this show, besides, besides the fact that I love it and I watched it my entire life, is that this is a really good comparison to Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. Roosevelt is just like Adam. He is crazy. He's impetuous. He runs around. He's full of energy. And he looks like he's doing a lot, but he's really not. On the other hand, William Howard Taft is going to do many of the exact same things that Teddy Roosevelt does, but he does them better. He does more things while he is president, but he gets less recognition because he's not so vocal about it, much like Jamie does on the Mythbusters. 
sure hope that comparison makes sense in about 15 years if I'm still using these exact same video lectures. Maybe I'll re-record them. Anyway, William Howard Taft is going to be a very successful president by basically doing everything that Roosevelt did, but doing it better. I guess it's the best way to describe him, is that he does it better than Roosevelt does. He's going to break up more harmful trust. He's going to set aside land for the country. He is going to um, be involved in legal decisions and make other important changes in this country that are going to echo the exact same sentiments that TR had, and he's going to be a better leader of the progressive era, but he's less well-known today because he's not as outgoing, I guess is going to be a word I could use for that. Um, let's talk about some stuff he does while he is president. One of the first things Taft does as president is help usher in the 16th Amendment. Now, in the past, there hasn't been necessarily any taxes on the income of American citizens. There haven't been any taxes. Um, well, that worked out just fine when the government still had American land to sell. In fact, most of the taxes in this country were made from or sorry, most of the tax revenue, I should say, was made from selling land. Well, in the 1890s, in 1893, we declared the frontier closed, and now we need some other way for the country to raise money. We come up with this idea of the 16th Amendment, which is a fancy way of saying we come up with a income tax. Let's tax the income of every single American citizen. Let's tax every American a small amount. That's going to help pay for a lot of the improvements and regulations that we want as a country. That's that's how we're going to pay for them. It's also going to be seen as inherently democratic because basically if every American is going to be taxed, every American is going to have a little bit of a say in what goes on here. And it's going to take some power away from the big businesses that previously were helping fund government programs. Now if the average American citizen is doing it, it's going to look better for all of us. Unfortunately for Taft, maybe because he's not as boisterous, He's not going to be seen as super popular, even in his own party. Taft was too progressive for Republicans and not progressive enough for the Progressive Party. Neither group's really going to like him all that much. Because of all these tensions, the Republican Party is going to start to split under Taft's presidency. We're going to have the liberal progressives on one side and the old guard conservatives on the other. To make matters worse, Taft is going to anger Teddy Roosevelt, and the reason is not important now, I mean, it is, but not for this class. So, Roosevelt's going to say, you know what? I've been retired for four years, but now I want to come back. I want to come back and be president, which is going to lead us to the crazy election of 1912. Republicans are going to stick with uh, William Howard Taft, as he is the incumbent, which means he is the current sitting president. Democrats are going to run this new dude named Woodrow Wilson. Socialists are going to run this guy named Eugene V. Debs, not important. And a new political party is going to be created called the Progressive Republican Party, or the Bull Moose Party. This is going to be led by Teddy Roosevelt. If you pay attention, what just happened here was that the Republican Party is going to be split in two. On one hand, we're going to have Taft. On the other hand, we're going to have Roosevelt. And what do we know happens every single time a political party is split in two? I'll pause awkwardly while you answer. That's correct, Billy. Good job. Let's take a look at the map. Hey, look, a map. Now, you'll notice here that the Republican Party has now been split between Teddy Roosevelt and Taft. And if we do some complicated math here, again, I'm not a math major, but you'll notice if you look at the popular vote, 27.5% of this country is going to vote for Roosevelt, and 23% is going to vote for Taft. You add those numbers together, and I believe that comes out to 50.5%. 50.5% of this country agreed with the Republican slash progressive philosophy that Taft and Roosevelt had both done. Yet, they are going to lose this election because the Republican Party's votes are going to be split, and instead, the Democrat, Woodrow Wilson, who less Americans want as president, is going to become president. I've told you guys time and again, there is nothing worse for a political party than splitting in two, and now you can see again what happens when a political party does split in two. Um, now before we can move on and talk about Woodrow Wilson as president, sometimes the AP exam likes to ask you about the different philosophies of 
President Wilson and really his real opponent in this election, which is uh, Teddy Roosevelt. So let's talk about those real quick. It's called New Freedom versus New Nationalism. Taft essentially essentially gives up in the election of 1912. So the, the arguments are going to be between Wilson and Teddy. So what do they say? Roosevelt is going to argue for something called New Nationalism, which basically means the government would take a larger role in the economy, it would allow women the right to vote, and there would be some sort of a federal welfare program set up to help the poorest Americans. This is mostly going to be popular because the country is so in love with Roosevelt. Wilson is going to counter with this idea called New Freedom, which is going to promise a smaller government, smaller business influence, and support for the average American. Both of those ideas sound great, and they're really both going to kind of reflect what's essentially been happening here. Um, the progressive movement is so large and so popular that really both the Republican and Democratic Party, by the year 1912, have essentially adopted its ideas of Let's make some changes. Let's fix some of the problems of the country. Let's make this country better for everyone. Both parties have essentially adopted it during this time period. Now, your textbook could end the story here, but there's a couple of more loose ends it needs to figure out in the progressive era before we can finally get involved in World War I. So let's talk about the presidency of Woodrow Wilson before World War I. One of Wilson's main goals as president is to lower the tariffs. Again, as we know, tariffs are designed to encourage people to buy American because a tariff is going to make a American product less expensive than a foreign product by adding a tax on that foreign product. Wilson's going to argue that we need to lower these tariffs. That way American can be really more involved in the trade of the rest of the world. We've been focused on ourselves for so long, and that's been great. We've really grown, but the world is starting to change, and we need to actually be more involved in trade worldwide. That's going to be a big belief of Woodrow Wilson, so he wants to lower tariffs. He's going to help Congress pass through the Underwood Tariff Bill, which is essentially going to lower tariffs. Um, and to, do, uh, to make up the tax deficit, he wants to tax the, tax the rich. That's going to be a common story among Democrats. From this time on, though, tax revenue is always going to bring in more money in this country than tariffs do. We still have tariffs to this day, but most of our government's money is going to come from taxes, not from tariffs. Wilson is going to want to um, take a look at the banks of the United States. The banking system of the United States was in total disarray during this time period. To prevent future bank panics, there needed to be some sort of a central banking agency that banks could turn to to borrow money. The result of this is going to be the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. It's going to set up 12 regional banks, basically, and each bank is going to uh, give out, or I should say print, U.S. currency. Each, each of these uh, Federal Reserve banks is also going to lend out money to smaller banks or businesses. The Fed is basically a place where banks can do their banking, if that makes sense. It's a place where banks can do banking. That way they can be involved in the economy. Wilson's also going to continue the government regulation of businesses. He's going to, or the government's going to create during this time period the Federal Trade Commission, which is a new watchdog agency with the power to investigate violations of federal laws require reports from corporations, and shut down businesses who violate any sort of federal law. Next is going to be this thing called the Clayton Antitrust Act. This antitrust act is actually going to make a list of activities that violate federal laws. And unlike the Sherman Antitrust Act, this antitrust act is going to be very detailed and very effective. Nearly 100 lawsuits were filed using this act, which is going to break up most of the trust that exists in the United States. So it's going to be very, very successful. And really, this is going to be the end of the story of the progressive era. Let's go ahead and recap what we've learned and see if the progressive era is actually successful. Okay, so again, the progressive movement starts small and ends up big. So let's look at some of the things that ended up happening during this era. So we have the 16th Amendment, which is going to be a tax on the income of every American that works. 
Next, we have the 17th Amendment, which is going to be the direct election of U.S. Senators. Next, we have the 18th Amendment, which is going to be prohibition, which is going to be the banning of the sale of alcohol in this country. And then we're going to have the 19th Amendment, which is going to be women's rights to vote. These are all things that we've discussed in this chapter that start as a small change to make America more democratic or to fix our problems that are going to lead to a national change that literally changes how this country is run with the U.S. Constitution. So, did progressives actually meet their goals? Let's go through these. They wanted to return control of the government to the people. Well, 17th Amendment helps with that. Uh, as does all the other things of the Wisconsin experiment. They wanted to make industry more humane. Well, you have the muckrakers, and you have books like The Jungle, which are going to be part of that. They want to protect the social welfare. Well, you guys are all suffering in school, so they've done that. <clears throat> they wanted to foster efficiency in business and in government. Now, we didn't really talk about this so much per se, but let's just say that they actually do do this and not go through the long, long list of legal codes as to how. Let's just pretend that they do, because they do. Uh, next, create economic reforms. Well, there's the 16th Amendment, and we're going to change our tax structure, and we're going to drastically break apart these big monopolies. That's a pretty big change in how the government is going to be, or that's a big change in economic reform. Promote moral improvement? Well, yeah, sure. We're going to basically ban alcohol in this country, and we're also going to stop our prostitution problem. Allowed women and minorities to be involved in the political process? Well, women are. Women are going to get the 19th Amendment, which is going to allow them the right to vote. If there is a failing of the progressive era, it's actually going to be when it comes to minorities. Black Americans and other minority Americans are not going to get a lot of help and a lot of resources or a lot of attention from the U.S. government or its citizens during this time period. And things are only going to get worse for black Americans and minority Americans because something's going to come along that's going to distract all of us. That's World War I, but that's a story for another chapter. Good luck on your test, kids.